a first felony offender. Offenses, armed robbery, manslaughter. Sentencing dates are September 8th, 1999. Sentence to a total of 50 years. Parole date, August 1st, 2021. Good time, September, September 3rd, 2047. And full term, January 1st, 2048. Is this information correct, sir? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Good morning, Mr. Wilkins. Good morning. I can tell you're nervous. Yes, I am. So just take a deep breath. And we're just going to talk about some things related to your case, all right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, you're 48 years old? Yes, ma'am. And you've served about 24 years, a little over 24 years? Yes, ma'am. That's correct. Okay. Um, so you were, what, mid-20s when this crime took place? 25, I think. It's mid-20s. Uh, I read the I read the facts of the case. I'm familiar with the facts, but the thing that I don't understand is the why. Uh, why the the three of you uh, decide to to commit this crime involving Mr. Solomon? I got the impression that you all really didn't know him that well. No ma'am. And had you just met him that day? We met a couple of days beforehand, and then. Went to a party. Right. Night. Yeah. I think you met at a gas station or somewhere and uh, got invited to a, a party and he was there. And the three of you ended up leaving with Mr. Solomon. And then his body was eventually discovered uh, in a wooded area. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. So, what was the motive behind this crime? Why did you all choose to? to commit this crime. I really, I can't, I really can't answer that. You know, it's just, I Did can't. Did you try? If I, if I say anything. She just wants to know why you did it, uh, uh, Dennis. You don't have to. Tell the whole story. Just no, tell them why y'all committed the crime. I'm saying I don't want to. I want to try to justify it because it, it well, was wrong. Well, I'm not asking you. Okay, let, let me let me do it this way. Why did y'all leave the party with him? What was the reason that you all left the party with him? We were supposed to go to the store and get some more beer for the for the party. Right. right. That was that was the beginning of it. And did y'all go to a store? Yes, ma'am. We got some beer and we decided to, to ride around and we wound up in the woods. Okay, well, wait. Tell me why y'all didn't just go back to the house with the beer. What was the riding around about? Uh, we were supposed to be spotlighting deer. That was what we were going to do. Okay. So how did that turn into... Um, Mr. Solomon being killed. I think it was more of an argument that started between him and I, but it wound up. What was the argument about? It was about, I couldn't, I, I don't even remember what the argument was about, but it wound up being, you know, a robber. That's what it wound up being. All right. And so uh, he was shot uh, in the head. Uh, he was told to kneel on the ground and he wouldn't do it and attempted to get up and then he was shot. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. Uh, well, let's talk about uh, the last 24 uh, plus years. Um, Tell me, tell me um, what you have, first, how long have you been at David Wade? Since 
2009. Okay, and where were you before uh, Wade? In Angola. All right. Um, so since you've been at Wade, tell, tell us first, what's your job there? Do you have a job? Uh, I work at the, uh, the horse barn, taking care okay. of the horses and animals at the horse barn. How long have you done that? Since 2013, 2013. Okay, and what did you do when you first got there in 2009? I worked at a cattle farm in 2009. Okay. First I was on crew one, then the cattle farm. All right. And what was your job in Angola? I was working at the mule barn in Angola. A lot of wild, a lot of animals. Yes. Um, so um, tell me, um, are you a trustee where you are? Yes, ma'am. How long have you been a trustee? Here? Since 2009. Okay. Were you a trustee while you were at uh, Angola? Yes, ma'am. And how long have you been a trustee at Angola? Uh, from 2005 to 2009, till I got transferred here. I show that you only had you've only had three write-ups in 24 years. Uh, the last write-up was almost 20 years ago, with 20 years in September, and that was for a violation of Rule Three, which was defiance. But since then. You've not had any other write-ups, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Uh, what kind of programs uh, have you taken, Mr. Um, Wilkins, over the time that you've been at Wade? Here at Wade, I've been through uh, AANA, the 12 steps, I've been through. Okay, let, let's, stop, let's stop right there. Back uh, when this crime happened, tell, tell us about your drug or alcohol use. I, I had a real bad drug and alcohol problem. What kind of drugs were you using? I was using meth, marijuana, anything really. It was bad. All right, and also drinking? Yes, ma'am. So tell me how long you've been involved in AA and NA. Since 2010, I do believe, 2010, when I got into AA and NA. Are you still in AA and NA? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, do you facilitate or are you? Uh, do you just participate? I took the 12 step program and facilitate the 12 step program. And how long have you been a facilitator? Uh, since 2013, I think. I'm not for sure. I think it started in 2013. Have you completed any other substance abuse programs other than AA or NA? I've been through Celebrate Recovery and uh, Substance Abuse 1, Substance Abuse 2, but I took that in Angola. All right. Um, uh, tell me, tell me what programs have you found to be most helpful? I think the Celebrate Recovery, the Anger Management, and AANA. And tell us why. Why those have been important to you, what you learn. Well, AA, the Celebrate Recovery and AANA is basically the same thing, except for Celebrate Recovery is Christian-based and it's more of a religious type 12 steps. And as far as the anger management, anger management kind of made me look at myself and kind of look in the mirror at, at who I really am. And what did you see when you looked in the mirror? It wasn't, it wasn't what I, I liked. I had to change a lot of things. 
And what do you think the biggest change has been over the last 24 years? I, I, had, to, I had to learn to stop hating myself and I learned to look at myself in a different view and start loving myself. Um, what kind of um, vocational programs have you taken, you know, job related, something that would prepare you to um, have a job once you're released? Well, I've been shoeing horses since 2005. I learned how to do that when I was in Angola. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been I've been working construction before that. But, uh, okay. I've been doing that ever since. Uh, what what about what is agriculture equipment operator? That's, that's driving tractors and and doing the bush hogging in the fields and and fertilizing, vaccinating cattle, vaccinating horses, worming vaccine, worming horses and cattle. And what about this software education you were involved in? What was that about? That was going through a uh, free GED and learning how to use a Dell computer. Okay. But you have obtained your GED? Yes, ma'am. You did that in, while you were in Angola? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, Warden, what can you tell us about, um, well, let me go back. Mr. Walkins, if you were to be released, tell us what your transition plan is. Well, I've got a job already. Where? At, uh, what is it? Construction of, I think, I think 4G contract of construction. And where and where is that company located? It's it's based out of Pennsylvania, but I think they have a a yard in Monroe, but they work from state to state. They're in New Orleans right now. No, that's, that's do you understand that moving from state to state would be problematic for someone who's on parole because you'd have to have permission from your parole officer anytime you left the state and then would have to stay in communication with them when you're out of the state. So how would you manage that? I could work at the yard in, in Monroe. Okay. Or go this, what was the name of that? Logan Sport. Logan Sport. They have a warehouse in Logan Sport. I also have a job off of that. How, how did you make connections with this company? that they would offer you a job? The one in Logansport or the construction? Whichever. Well, the one in Logansport was a friend of mine that, that offered me that job. And what would that job be? Working in a warehouse. OK. And what about the construction job? That is, that is uh, my brother-in-law. Mr. Job. Graves? That, no, that is the warehouse, Mr. Graves. All right. Uh, because you have 4G contractors, Grant Graves, so that's warehouse work? Right. Well, who is Diane? Okay. Because you don't list the, um, the other company. Uh, and where would you be living? I'd live with my mother until I got on my feet. And what's your mom's name? Diane Youngblood. And she's the one who lives in Mansfield? Yes, ma'am. Well, what's your plan to maintain your sobriety? Well, my mother just told me about a place in Sabine Parish that I would, I would really like to check out and go and give my testimony to and, and really get into 12 steps there. Well, what, what do you think you need to do to maintain your sobriety? Stay on the track I'm on right now. What would that look like? 
to be around my loved ones and the supporters I have out there to, to keep me grounded. Well, a lot of people have loved ones around them, but that doesn't necessarily keep them grounded. What do you think you need to actually stay sober? To not go back to what I was doing. Well, easier said than done. It is. So mm -hmm. how would you do it? Just keep the faith and stay in AA in it. Okay, that's what I'm getting at. So how, how long do you think you need to, to stay in AA and NA? As long as, long as I live. Okay. And that's something you're committed to doing? Yes, ma'am. All right. Warren, what can you tell us about uh, Mr. Um, Wilkins? Well, I can tell you, uh, just just confirm things he's already told you. He's 09, he's got an excellent conduct record, excellent work history. He's been a trustee here at Way since 2009. He's worked at our range herd and he's worked at our horse barn the entire time he's been here, but he's also helped us with numerous construction jobs. He's a very skilled individual. He can operate backhoes, tractors, bulldozers. Uh, he can build, he can frame. Uh, he's a good framing carpenter. He's got carpenter skills. He's uh, helped build barns and things for us over the years. He's been very involved in the 12-step uh, program here at this institution. He, he mentors people in his dormitory all the time. I see him quite often, uh, uh, even when they're not in in, in uh, organized meetings. He's still he still he's still mentoring that program, and and he works really hard towards. Uh, uh, towards living that lifestyle. And I've, I've watched this guy for a long time and uh, I've seen that in him since he's been here. It's not anything new. And he's, he did earn his GED and he's taken all these programs and you'll notice he doesn't earn good time. So he's done these things for to better himself. Uh, I've gotten to know his family over the years. They come up and visit. He's got good family support. I, I see him in the visitation room uh, quite often. I always make a point to go by and say hello to him. They're, they're very... Uh, uh, very involved in his in his life, and I think they will provide him with a good uh, a good residence and a good solid foundation for him to get started. Uh, and also, I'll point out that uh, he's uh, he's got an honor card, which reflects his excellent work history and excellent uh, disciplinary history. And he's got a uh, His work evaluation as submitted by his supervisor in the field where he works, it was all excellent. So uh, Wilkins has worked hard to prepare himself. Uh, he's a model prisoner at this institution. I can, uh, I, you know, I consider him one of the, um, one of the guys that really has his head on straight and really has an interest in not coming back to prison when he's given the opportunity to get out. That's all I have, Ms. Jackson. I thank you, Warren. Um, um, Mr. Wilkins, I will tell you that you have opposition uh, from uh, Mr. Solomon's family. I'm sure you can understand why they would be opposed to your release. Uh, but that's all I have, Mr. Wise. At this time, I see one of the, uh, Mr. Roche has something you'd like to say. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have any questions. Um, Mr. Wilkins, I'd like to make an observation. You were made eligible for parole by Act 122 of uh, 2021. Before that, you had no possibility or your parole date was way in the future. But when you arrived at David Wade, in 2009, you started getting ready to be released. You took Cairo's weekend in 2011. You did Living in Balance in 2007. You did Anger Management in 2004. You took a course in CPR in 2001. You didn't wait until you received a parole date. You started preparing from the beginning. And I'm very impressed. Uh, your last disciplinary was 20 years ago. 
you started preparing and you should be commended for that. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you very much. I see you as a speaker, Mr. Uh, Reese Youngblood, the father. You would unmute your mic. Okay. Okay. See if it got it. Okay, anything you'd like to say to the board? Okay, this is, uh, I'm uh, Reese Youngblood. I'm his step pop. I've been in, uh, been pop uh, ever since the day one. I would like to thank the state of Louisiana and all personnel who were involved in uh, shaping Debo into the man he is now. We have missed him. We have missed our picnic visits due to the COVID. We've had a few telephone calls with him, and uh, we. Uh, uh, we would like to, we'd like to have him closer. Uh, his mother and I are in, are not in the best of health of anymore. We're not getting any younger. And it's getting harder and harder for us to travel. So we would love to see Debo home. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, at this time, I see another speaker, Prentice Taylor, brother-in-law. Uh, you would uh, meet your mic. And speak. Yes, sir. My name is Prentice Taylor, and just like to thank y'all for giving me the opportunity to speak at this hearing. Uh, uh, just like to say that I'd like to be a, a good support group for Debo when he gets out. If uh, Uh, prepared for Debo if if he's uh, able to come to it, and uh, would like to just just be there for him and help him to uh, help him to stay grounded, help him to have his family around him, and uh, and just keep him on track. And uh, I'd like to offer him the job, but uh, it, it'd be totally up to him whether he keeps the job. And and I know I know he would. I know seeing the changes that he's made in the in the years that he's been there uh i've seen him change a lot just uh again I'd like to thank y'all for this opportunity okay thank you very much at this time is there anything you'd like to say the board before we vote uh sure. the the jobs that i normally go on usually last for a long time. <laughs> mr prince i will uh Thank you for your comments and everything. Uh, Dennis, anything you'd like to say? I'd, I'd like to say thank you for, for this opportunity and and I'm gonna continue on on this journey, you know, whatever happens, just thank you. Thank you too. At this time, uh, Ms. Jackson will be voting. Mr. Wilkins, this was a really bad crime, but of course, a lot of what we deal with are very bad crimes. Um, but I think that over the course of the last 24 and a half years, you've made tremendous strides. It's um, phenomenal that you've only had three write-ups in over 24 years, the last one being uh, 20 years ago. So that speaks well uh, of your adjustment. And as Mr. Roche said, you started working on your issues even before there was any possibility that you would be coming up for uh, an early release, which indicates that you were doing it not just to be in the program, but to really work on your issues. You have positive comments from the warden. You have a good program. You have some vocational skills. He said you're very talented in a lot of areas. You have a good support system from your family. 
and you have a good transition plan. So I feel comfortable today uh, voting in your favor and uh, granting your request for early release. Is your brother already out? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right, well, hopefully uh, he'll be a good support for you and you'll be a good support for him. But my vote today is to grant. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Roche. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Debo, job well done. The last 24 years have served you well. My vote is the same as uh, Mrs. Jackson for the same reasons. And I'm gonna add some conditions after release. I will have a curfew from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. I want you to attend at least three NAA meetings a week. You can attend more, but I want you to attend at least three per week. And I want you to give back to the community. I want you to do five hours of community service every month. Good luck. Thank you. At this time, since I'm going to be voting the same as my colleagues today with the same conditions being granted. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So let's unpack this. Um, I'm gonna start by, we're gonna go over the facts of the case, which are brutal. And then we're going to watch his co-defendant's parole hearing. Now what's particularly unique about this is that his co-defendant has his parole hearing the same day as his. It's just about an hour after. So I don't think we've ever seen that before. So the board is interviewing both co-defendants within about an hour of each other, which is fascinating. I'm curious to see what the results will be. Now, with with this parole hearing, I got to say, and, and, and this uh, I love, I think we most of us if, uh, love Miss Jackson's interview style, um, but I felt like she kind of let him get away with it. It was like she already had her mind up beforehand because asking him about the facts of the case, remember, he they killed a man. And when she asked him, well, what were you fighting about? Why did it happen? And he's like, I don't really remember. It was over some money or something. I don't really. And when you go into the facts of the case, because I was reading this during the parole hearing, I was like, wow, it's brutal. So with that, let's jump in. And thank you, Richard, for tying everything together. On December 26, so it's the day after Christmas, the victim, David Solomon, was at a small party in honor of his birthday. Among those present at the party were Danny and Dennis, brothers, and the defendant. At one point in the evening, the victim left with the defendant, and the two Wilkin brothers go to a nearby store to buy more beer. Now, this is not his, remember they said, is his brother out? This is not the same defendant that we're that we're going to see here. Or I know they said her brother was locked up, so maybe the brother was also involved. You know, that I'm not sure, but we're gonna watch one of the defendants, not his brother. At one point in the evening, the victim left with the defendant and the two Wilkin brothers to go to a nearby store to buy more beer. After purchasing the beer, the four men traveled in the defendant's car to a scheduled spot in the rural woods of DeSoto Parish, ostensibly to go deer hunting. The victim complained repeatedly that he wanted to go home. Dennis Wilkins and the defendant walked off a short distance. When they rejoined the others, Dennis Wilkins pointed a shotgun at the victim. When the victim retreated into the car, Dennis Wilkins ordered him to get out of the vehicle and kneel down. Initially, the victim complied. However, he and Dennis Wilkins exchanged words, and at some point, the victim stood up. While the victim was standing, Dennis Wilkins shot him in the chest. I mean, this is 
This is the man, the interview who we just saw. And at some point, the victim stood up while the victim was standing. Okay, sorry. So as he lay on the ground bleeding, the victim reached into his pocket and threw his money, about $400, on the ground. Dennis Wilkins then asked the defendant if he wanted to do it, kill the victim. The defendant said that he would. He loaded the shotgun and shot the victim in the head. I mean, this is... <laughs> this is... <laughs> It's just sick. And this is what I'm talking about with the interview. Like, I feel like Miss Jackson just let him off. Like, this is just cold-blooded insanity. It's just disturbing sickness. And the idea that there's no DA here, you know, they said the victims were opposed, but they didn't. I mean, it's just, how does something like this happen? It's just out of... It, seem, it seems for absolutely no reason whatsoever. It gets me angry. It really does. The, defend, the defendant and Dennis Wilkins dragged the victim's body into the woods in an effort to conceal it. After picking up the victim's money and the beer cans they had dropped on the ground at the crime scene, the three men went to a truck to purchase gasoline and some snacks. When the defendant and Danny Wilkins dropped off Dennis Wilkins, Dennis gave each of the men $100 of the victim's money. So it was two brothers and then another man who were going to see his parole hearing. It's, uh, in the days following the murder, the three men attempted to conceal evidence connecting them to the crime. They destroyed or got rid of the shoes they were wearing when they killed the victim. They also changed the tires on the defendant's car so that the police would not be able to match them to the tracks of the crime scene. The defendants and Danny cleaned the murder weapon and hid it under a log at the defendant's camp. Wow, great hiding spot under a log. Several days later, a missing persons report on the victims was filed at the Soto Parish office at the learning that the victim um, had last been seen at the, in the company of the defendants of the Wilkins brothers. The authorities questioned Danny. Post Miranda, Danny Wilkins informed them of the victim's homicide. In his statement, Danny Wilkins told officers that the defendant fired a fatal shot. I love how they do this and then they just confess. It's like the statement was consistent with the trial testimony given by both Wilkins brothers. He provided the police with the map showing the location of the body and accompanied them to the site where the homicide weapon was hidden. A DeSoto Parish grand jury filed an uh, indictment charging all three men with first degree homicide and armed robbery. The state filed notice of its intent to seek the death penalty. Can you imagine that? The state files an, uh, an application for the death penalty. And this is, this is 1997, okay? This is 2001, the appeals decided. This didn't happen like 40 years ago, um, although it happened quite some. Time does go by pretty quickly, but it's not like it. And then ah, time goes by. The DA doesn't, you know, the, the, the state was so eager to, 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 to execute them. And now they don't even show up to their, to their parole hearing. Danny Wilkins enters a plea agreement whereby he pled guilty to the offense of accessory after the fact to second degree uh, homicide and conspiracy to commit armed robbery. He uh, received a agreed upon concurrent sentence of five years at hard labor on the accessory and seven years of hard labor without benefit of parole, probation, suspension, a sentence on a conspiracy. Well, that's a golden handshake. That's why we didn't see him. At, uh... <laughs> Likewise, Dennis Wilkins pled guilty to manslaughter and armed robbery, receiving concurrent sentences of 40 years at hard labor and 50 years uh, at hard labor without benefit of armed robbery, um, without benefit. Now, because of Act 122, he's, he's allowed to have a parole hearing. The state amended the first degree murder charge against the defendant in second degree after the defendant waived his right to a jury trial. A bench trial was held on the charge of second degree. The defendant was convicted of a responsive verdict to manslaughter and sentenced to 40 years. Um, let's go watch the next parole hearing now, see how well he does and while uh, we're watching that, I'll read through this and see if there's anything worthwhile to look over here. But uh, I don't know if you feel the same way as I do after 
hearing just how brutal and senseless and disturbing it was, the idea that I felt he just got a, the victim was ignored in this case and, and he, he got away easy in the questioning. Frankly, that's just what it seemed like to me, but let's go jump into the next one. Second felony offender, offenses, manslaughter, aggravated battery. Sentencing dates are July 11, 2000 and May 10, 2012. Sentenced to a total of 41 years. Parole date, August 1st, 2021. Good time, November 19, 2032. Full term, January 2nd, 2039. Is this information correct, sir? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Wise. Mr. Wise, you are muted. Sorry about that, Ms. Teresa. You know, as I look here, you're a second offender and uh, you have adjustment date on 1119 of 2032. You lost 633 days of uh, loss of good time, but you restored some days. Uh, tell me about all these uh, times loss of good time. Well, I was living kind of bad, just not really caring, and I was catching a lot of my guys, and they was taking good time for them. You know, as I as I go back over here, I was looking at some of your write-ups. Uh, when was your last disciplinary write-up? Uh, I believe August or September of 2016. Of 16? Yes, sir. Yeah, it was a it was a twenty one. Yes, sir. It was a twenty one. You know, was, uh, you, you've had a lot of anger. What about your anger management uh, stuff? Did you work on your anger problems? Yes, sir. I did. I've taken anger management, and I just come to myself that I quit blaming other people for my problems and started taking my accountability for what I did. And that's helped me a lot. You know, you 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 restored some you restored some days, but uh, you were on a manslaughter, aggravated battery, forty years, and uh, if I'm correct, you've done ten years of that. Is that correct? No, I've done twenty four years of that. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I read I read this wrong. Yeah, twenty four. Uh, so you've done 24 years of your sentence on a 40 year. If you were to get out, where would you live? With my parents in Keithville, Louisiana. In Keithville. The victim in this case here, did you know the victim's family and all? Or do they all live right there or where do they live? No, sir. Uh, the, that happened in DeSoto Parish, but I can't tell you where they live. That, you know, yeah, that, but none of the family lives around where you're going to be living? Not to my knowledge, no, sir. Okay. I just want you to know there's some opposition to your release, a lot of opposition to your release there. Uh, uh, what kind of work do you, what kind of work you going to try to do when you get out? My brother is going to initially give me a job at his transmission shop until I can find me something better. And hopefully it's in a welding shop somewhere. I will for you. Okay. Good. Right. Yeah, as I look back on your rest reports, there is. Did you uh, have you completed uh, all your pre-release and everything? I'm currently taking it right now. How long do you like for you get? Hey, Warden, uh, is any, how long is he like for you gets through with that, Warden? I think he's got about two months left, Mr. Wise. He just started, I think, in January, and it's a great four month program. So he should be completing in, uh, in, in about two months. Okay. I don't have any questions. Uh, I see uh, Miss Bonnie has some questions. 
Right. How you doing, Mr. Wisely? I'm pretty good. Nervous. That's understandable. Um, you're a co-defendant with uh, Mr. Uh, Wilkerson, Dennis Wilkerson, who was also seen by us today. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And this case involved the uh, killing of a gentleman by the name of David Solomon. Is that yes, correct? Yes, ma'am. What was your involvement in his death? I shot him. Okay. And you all had just met Mr. Solomon a couple of days before this incident. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And you had been invited to a party and you all went to the party uh, a couple of days later. Uh, and then um, three of you left with the victim. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. What was the plan? Where were y'all going and how did this turn into a homicide? When we left the house, we was going to the liquor store to get some more liquor. Did y'all make it to the liquor store? Yes, ma'am. All right, once you got the liquor, uh, why didn't you go back to the party? I don't know. We just decided that we were going to shoot him. And we you just, I'm sorry, you just decided what? That we were going to shoot him. Why? I, I had no idea. I, I can't but, but you were there. I mean, you know what y'all talked about was the plan to rob him. I, what? What was going on? Oh, man. Uh, Dennis just wanted to shoot him, and I, I went along with it. Right. Oh, Dennis and the victim had gotten an argument earlier, and I guess it just kept building up. Yeah, but you were the one that shot him in the head. Yes, ma'am. I was. So why would you shoot him if the argument was between he and Dennis? Dennis asked me to. And other than that, I, I have no reason. There was no reason at all. Right. And tell me what kind of programs you've done. I'm, I'm not seeing a whole lot. So tell me what kind of programs you've completed over the last 24 years. Got my GED, I completed HVAC, thinking for a change, anger management. What what about substance abuse treatment? I'm currently taking it now. I can't hear you. I'm currently taking it now. What are you taking? Living in balance. So you haven't completed living in balance? No ma'am. When did you first start taking programs? Uh, about two years ago. I got my GED in 2006, I believe. And I got my HVAC trade, I believe, in 2004. Okay, but what, what about some of the DOC programs, the self-improvement programs? When did you start taking those? About two years ago. Year Why ago. did it take so long? I don't, I don't know. Just kept just, putting it off. Just weren't interested? Yes, ma'am. So you only started taking them because you thought it would help you get out of prison? No, I had signed up for them before this act even come about. Yeah, but again, you've been incarcerated for over 24 years, and a lot of people, even with long sentences, managed to have a few more programs than you have. And I'm just trying to find out uh, the reason why you don't have a whole lot of programs. Yes, ma'am. Like I guess, like you said, I just wasn't interested. I guess. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Wisely. That's all I have. Okay, I see today the your sister has something to say here, the speaker. Uh, if you would unmute your mic, and you can speak to us, ma'am. Okay. Um. I'd just like to say my name is Tracy King and I'm speaking um, on my brother Timothy Wisely's behalf. 
and I'm speaking for myself, my family, and my parents. Um, just kind of wanted to to say that we've you know watched him grow over the years and and become a better person. Um, and if y'all give him the chance, you know, to get out into the mainstream society again, you know, he's got a huge support system. We have a huge family. Uh, he would be living with my parents, which is right across the street from myself. We can um, do everything we can to help <laughs> him to, you know, do any programs he needs. His brother's, you know, going to give him a job. So we just, you know, they're old. They're getting to where they, they can't drive that far to go visit him. You know, it would just like, they would like the rest of their years left with him at home. Um, so hopefully, you know, y'all give him that chance. Okay. That, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. At this time, uh, Timothy, anything you'd like to say to the board before we vote? Well, I'd just like to apologize to the victim and his family because what we did was wrong. You know, but I am a better person today than I was. And I strive every day to be a better person. And I just hope you give me a chance to be home with my family and show them that I'm a better person. You know, that's you know, about it. Okay, thank you. Ward, is anything you have to say? Yeah, I just want to uh, point out, I guess, to answer Miss Jackson's question, a lot of the uh, time that Timothy's been incarcerated, he's, he's spent a good bit of time in the cell block. I don't know if you, you probably noticed that based on his conduct record and conduct right. report. He, uh, that's probably probably a lot of the reason why he hasn't had a lot of programming, but he got transferred back to us in uh, 2017. He came back from Angola, I think, when they closed the uh, Camp J unit down, he transferred back up to Wade, and, and and for the last four years, four and a half years, I've been been spending a lot of time with uh, wisely talking to him, and he, we got him, uh, you know, he sees he sees uh, Dr. Seal, who, who's our psychiatrist, who's got him on some medication, he's very compliant with his medication, and he, he's became interested in doing some positive things, and he's gotten involved in some programming, and he did all this prior, you know, some of it prior to that. 122 being uh, uh, being signed into law, he's he's a changed person. I know he is because I've had him since 2008. I've known him since 2008, 2007, somewhere around in there, and uh, he's not the same individual he was then. Since since he's been back here in 2017, he's uh, he's become a pretty solid citizen of this institution. By that I mean he's been very active in the uh, in positive things. He's participated in the program. He hadn't had a single write-up. He hadn't had a write-up since 2016. And he's uh, really, really putting his best foot forward and, uh, you know, trying to improve his conduct record. And I, I gave him, I'm the one that restored most of that good time. He's gotten a good bit of his good time back. Uh, I think he's got over 500 days of it back, but he did lose a significant amount of good time between David Wade and LSP over the years. But a lot of those, he was pretty young and that was you know, a good bit of good bit of time ago. Uh, but since 2017, he's been doing very well, Mr. Wise. I just want to point that out. Uh, over the last five years, he's he's really made a, a remarkable improvement. He's a pleasure to talk to, a pleasure to visit with. And in years past, he wasn't that much of a pleasurable individual to talk to and visit with. But he really uh, he's made a 360 in his attitude, his demeanor, and his outlook on life. And he's He's expressed a lot of remorse for the crime he's committed. He and I have, have had a couple of conversations about that. And that's something that he never did, did before. I mean, that he's, uh, he's, he's remorseful for what he did and for what got him into prison and for wasting all these years of his life doing the things that were non-productive when he could have been productive. So that's all I got to say. Okay. You know, Timothy, as I go over there and I look at, and I've looked over your write-ups, I look where you went to LSP and you stayed down there and you came back and you lost a lot of times where Dennis was being able to do programs, you weren't able to do programs. You understand? Yes. And, and I think that hurt you just a little bit. 
And I am saying this, I, I really want the best for you, but today I'm going to be voting to the nine. And I'm going to tell you this, I want you to write back as quick as you can, but get these programs under your belt, get programs under your belt. So you'll be ready to go. What's hurt you is these loss of good times and stuff that you had and you missed some programs. I want you to get those programs today. My vote is to uh, deny because of your loss of good time. And uh, I think you need more programs. Thank you. Mr. Roche. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wisely. Good afternoon. You've come a long ways. Yes. Sir. You've come a long ways. You spent a lot of time in a working cell block. And that sort of changed your way of thinking. Am I, am I correct? Yes, sir. Uh, the positive remarks by Warden Goodwin has really influenced me in your case. We have solid, really solid family support. We have multiple letters in your jacket from your families saying how they want you to come home and they all support you. That is the one thing that you need after incarceration. You need a support mechanism and you have that. You have a good transition plan. And you've served over 60% of your sentence. I think you've made a turnaround. Last write up was six years ago. Yes. I'm going to take that into consideration. And I'm going to give you an. an, an conditional grant this afternoon. I'm going to grant your request for early release after you complete 100 hours pre-release. I want you to enroll in complete victim awareness. I'm currently taking that right now, Mr. Roche. Okay, good. So you have a complete understanding of what you did to Mr. Solomon in his family, in your family. And I want you to complete the substance abuse program that you're currently enrolled in. So once you complete 100 hours pre-release, victim awareness and substance abuse, you'll be released if you get a positive vote today. Yes. After release, I want you to have a curfew from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. I want you to go to at least three NAAA meetings a week, and I want you to give back to the community. Complete five hours of community service. Good luck. This time, Ms. Bonnie Jackson. All right. Uh, Mr. Wisely. You know, this is a hard case. It, it, it truly is. I mean, a young man was senselessly killed, and you were actually the shooter uh, in the case. And the only reason you could give me is because, uh, you know, Dennis asked you to. That just kind of troubles me that you're that willing to do something just because somebody asked you to. Also, I have to look at the fact that you've had a pretty poor disciplinary history. And when I look at this other person in the same situation, he's only had three in the whole time he's been incarcerated. You indicated you weren't really that interested in taking programs until just recently. Uh, so you, you didn't seem to have any motivation to work on yourself. I mean, you have made some strides. I, I give you credit for that. You have started working in the right direction. And I'm glad to see that. Uh, but I think because of your poor disciplinary history and the fact that you just haven't taken enough programs, my vote today is going to be to deny you 
but I'm going to encourage you, as Mr. Wise said, to uh, you know apply again when you're eligible. And hopefully by that time, you'll have more programs. But, you know, people can sit in programs, and I'm not that impressed by programs unless you can tell me what benefit, what you learned from those programs. People can just sit in a room and, you know, get a certificate. But I'd, I'd like to see, you know, some, some growth in you and, and how you uh, learn from those programs. So I want you to work hard. I want you to get from those programs what they have to offer you and then, you know, see how it applies to you and how you're going to be able to use those programs, okay? But my vote today is to deny, but I encourage you to apply again when you're eligible. And good luck to you. At this time, the vote is to deny with the reason stated. Thank you very much. Well, that was interesting. Ms. Jackson brought up his uh, co-defendant that had the hearing before him. And I wonder if he already knew if it got through the grapevine that he had gotten uh, paroled. Imagine knowing that your co-defendant gets paroled coming in for the hearing with that expectations, but then not. But it's like, I mean, just think about it. Though. Why did he do it? I don't know. He told me to do it. So I did it. And it's like, you know, in, in one sense, at least he's not making an excuse that because it's probably what happened. <laughs> I mean, that's what we read. But on the other sense, there's just something so scary about that answer. There's no emotion. There's no tears. There's no like recall of memory. And like, there's really just nothing in either of their interviews. I didn't sense remorse. And really, frankly, I, I thought that both of them had terrible interviews when talking about why they did it. They, they both they just did it they don't even know why it seems that they just did it because they wanted to and they did it in a brutal cruel way um and it doesn't doesn't make me feel good that some people like that could get released into uh society i mean to think that he's been on lockdown for all those years in a working cell block only until recently You know, it's like, uh, it, you know, also what was interesting about this case is looking at him and listening to him, you wouldn't know that he's this career off the hook, unstable criminal. And doesn't that even make him more dangerous? Um, you just would have, have had no idea that you were looking at a, probably a period, I mean, just to, to, <laughs> to be stuck in work in cell block um, in Angola and then transferred to this prison where it's some, I guess, impressive things that you can see is like, there's a warden that took this guy under his wing and made sure to get him properly medicated and care for him and to make such a impactful statement where Mr. O'Shea actually said, sure, just finish a couple programs and you can be set on your ways. I don't know, man. It's, he is still locked up and um gosh it, it's uh it is fascinating to me that that just seeing these hearings they just it blows my mind now this is the the end of the report i know some of it's redundant but it is lower down on the page they're they're explaining why his uh his sentence wasn't excessive so let's just re-emphasize what happened the defendant, along with two other men, drove the victim away from his birthday party. Remember that? It's his birthday party. It's the day after Christmas. I mean, this guy has family, right? When, um, Although they didn't, you know, for whatever reason, we didn't see them here. But, um, but no DA, right? Uh, from his birthday party and into the woods to murder him. After the victims had already been shot once, the defendant agreed to do it. To kill him. The defendant loaded the shotgun, pointed it at the victim's head, and pulled the trigger. Afterwards, the defendant and his accomplices dragged the victim's body into the woods, took his money, and left his body to decay, to rot. The defendants took home a hundred dollars for his part in the murder. Wow. The subsequently he subsequently went to the great lengths to conceal his role in the homicide, destroying the hiding evidence. This is 
this whole appeal is about is on behalf of the man that we just saw. Um, Timothy Wisely. In light of those facts alone, the defendant's sentence is not grossly disproportionate to the crime he committed. Moreover, the defendant's present uh, pre-sentence PSI report also shows that his sentence is appropriate. The PSI report reveals that the defense, he had an extensive history. So the year 1999, he was arrested every single year from 1999, oh, from 1992 to 2000. He had an arrest every year for eight years. His arrests included disturbing the peace, DV, contributing to delinquency of a minor. Oh, oh, there's a real peach, this guy. Look at that. Look at that. Illegal possession of stolen things, simple criminal damage to property, and resisting arrest. In addition, even after the instance offense, the defendant arrested in April 2000 for second-degree battery. This charge was still pending when he was arrested for this. In light of the, defense, the, the defendant's extensive criminal record, coupled by the facts of the instance offense, the sentence of 40 years imprisonment uh, for the senseless murder is not... Uh, purposeless and needless infliction i would argue that it is the lightest sentence we've seen in louisiana for for this type of thing what and he had a trial he had a bench trial how do you get convicted of manslaughter this is crazy Okay, let's just think about this for one second now. Now that I, I, I heard this case, a judge took this as manslaughter? He didn't take a plea deal. The defendant, Timothy, was originally indicted for first degree. They wanted to give the death sentence. He took a bench trial instead of a jury trial. Following a bench trial on the amended charge of second degree, he was convicted of manslaughter, which was the maximum sentence. I, I'm, I'm, are you kidding me? How is shooting someone in the head with a shotgun while he's lying on the floor pleading for his life manslaughter? How is taking the life of an unarmed man on the night of his birthday manslaughter? How is taking him to the woods with two other, with three men against one? He doesn't have a weapon. You rob him and leave him in the woods to die manslaughter. And you see this guy's long record. He's a nightmare. He's a danger. Look at him. He's a danger. He's a brute in sheep's, in sheep's clothing. He's, he's, he's someone who cannot be free. That is disturbing. He is a, That is a ticking time bomb, in my opinion, to think that he's going to be set free one day. You got to be kidding me. Because he took a couple of programs? We've seen how messed up and broken this entire system is. And the idea that he even got this 40-year sentence and then because of Act 122 is now parole eligible. You know, when a judge gave the 40 years, he said, ah, so, you know, hold B, I guess the sentence was given in like 2000. So it'll be 2040 when he gets out. By that time, it'll be 70. Maybe the judge thought, okay, it's... But he's only 51 today. He's going to get out. I mean, like, well, you wouldn't, you probably wouldn't believe it if you didn't see it. Here you have it. Here you have it. When he comes up for his next parole hearing, we'll cover it. And uh, thank you, Richard, for lining up this info. He put in the notes. He said, man, dude, there's two cohorts on one day. Make sure you link it together. So I did. And with that, I'll let you.